and to carry on digitizing what we are doing. Um, the business has to transform, uh, and notably in the ways of working. Uh, so we're digitizing, there's the Internet of Things, people work more and more in the distance, and we have to manage more and more innovations. At the same time, we have also big opportunities, because if we manage to catch uh, these opportunities, uh, the hopes for bigger revenues, for bigger opportunities, for uh, bigger margins are high. So we are confronted with um, a very extreme context with high levels of risks, also very high opportunities and completely transforming ways of doing business. This is where um, uh, the statement. Now, the intention of this webinar is uh, to speak a little bit about how to manage that crisis and how to manage uh, the procurement in that turbulent area. Um, we need to go beyond the crisis. Uh, what's next and what will be uh, the position of procurement, the nature of procurement after all these crises are over? Uh, we have to also to, through this, to demonstrate that we are able to transform and that uh, procurement is not only adapting uh, the environment it's in, but is also able to take the lead in a context of difficulties. Uh, so we need to strategize the business future, uh, we need to manage ambiguity, and we need also to show, to demonstrate that we are able to explore uh, business opportunities. So what, what we are going to go through during this webinar uh, is two first parts about the problem, uh, the times of crisis, the changes that we're in, then going more into the details of how to manage that, uh, going beyond crisis, following the pace of the change. And we'll make three small focuses on three very interesting approaches which have emerged uh, in the last decade, let's say, ambidexterity, resilience, and management of polarity, which means managing two ambiguous opportunities uh, at the same time. So let's start to speak a little bit about uh, the, um, uh, the, the context, right? The times of crisis that we're in. Um, so uh, yeah, there have been many crises in the last years. Uh, everybody thinks about uh, COVID-19, of course, but if you remember well, uh, we've uh, suffered other crises such as uh, the Icelandic volcano, such as shortages, uh, such uh, as uh, crashes of prices, of availabilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so we're, we are in a time of multiple crises and heterogeneous crises. Um, crises, first of all, have become more probable. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, because, as you know, probability is measured by uh, the percentage of occurrence. And these crises have occurred much more frequently in the last decade uh, than in any other decade uh, after the Second World War. Uh, so um, raw materials shortage and uh, energy shortage and scarcity, uh, raw material prices, energy prices as a consequence strikes, country and political changes, uh, politi changes of political orientations, just think about the US, uh, Obama take on uh, global trade, Trump trade on the global trade, Biden tra take on the global trade, there are um, uh, a lot of changes, natural disasters which have accelerated uh, and also terrorism, uh, intellectual property infringement, and sustainable problems. External factors have increased. Crises have become more probable because external factors have become more intense. Um, probably due to the fact, or there's probably a correlation uh, with the fact that businesses are more globally active. Uh, right. Um, you know, probability is only one dimension of risks. Uh, it is uh, how frequent it is. Now, this is another dimension than the sev severity of the risk. Uh, crises are more probable, but they are also more impactful. That means that not only they are 
happening more and more, but they're also harming us more and more. Not because they happen more and more, but because they are more and more severe. Uh, why that? Um, because of our own procurement strategies in the last 30 years, uh, we have reduced inventories. We have outsourced. We have reduced the number of suppliers. We have concentrated our purchase, our spent on a small number of suppliers. We have delocalized. We have created a huge. We have created huge supply chains, global supply chains, which of course are more um, dangerous, more risky than the old uh, local supply chains. We have um, made uh, a, a few opportunistic cho uh, cho um, choices shipping, shifting uh, business volumes to cheaper suppliers. We have imposed price and payment conditions. We have globalized. So because of all this, supply chains have become more fragile because we've taken uh, advantage of price opportunities, of simplification opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, at the cost of many risks, uh, risk on inventories, risks uh, on... Uh, um, uh, on the supply security, um, res uh, risks uh, on the total cost or the future costs. So you understand uh, we have in reality increased either uh, the probability, that's not us of course, uh, the world has increased the prob probability of crisis, but at the same time uh, our own procurement strategies in the last 30 years have increased uh, the severity of the impacts on us. So uh, most of the decisions in procurement in the last 30 years have been taken uh, based on a direct cost reduction, notably a price reduction. Uh, but that was not necessarily in favor of a long-term total cost reduction or stability. So it means that our costs, our supply security, uh, our, our risks have become more fragile and that if anything happened, it harms us more. And bad news, things happen even more. Increased probability, we have increased our own impacts. On the top of it, we have to add something, which is that perception of the risk is subjective. And many sourcing risks have been under-evaluated. Uh, notably uh, in, in terms of global sourcing, uh, in terms uh, of, um, uh, 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 of market risks, of supplier risks, process risks, transportation risks. Um, risks have been under-evaluated because the choices, the strategies have been implemented at the time that everything went well. But then when crisis occurred, we saw that it would cost us a lot more than what we were thinking. Um, there are two extreme of risks, risks which uh, happen all the time but have a very small impact. Uh, this is what we call the known unknown. It's things that uh, at the end is unknown but we know a little bit because uh, it happens all the time. So we have learned how to manage that. Uh, this, these are controllable risks. And you have another type of risk which is the exact contrary. It doesn't happen very frequently, it's very rare, but uh, when it happens, it has a dramatic impact. It's rare, but it's severe, such as a natural disaster, such as a pandemic. So unmanaged risks uh, lead to crises. Um, you see uh, the opposition between these two types of risks. Uh, we have done a lot in risk management in the last 10 years in reality, but we have focused more on the green one than on the red ones. The one that we know may happen, that we know will happen, but we know how to reduce them. And since it happens regularly, uh, we have an experience in reducing these risks. And we haven't uh, really anticipated the unmanaged risks, which uh, lead uh, to big uh, crises. Um, there's also a, a, another dimension, which is that uh, as for these uh, unmanaged risks, we need to cut the chain of effect as soon as possible. You can see here two curves, curve A, the flat one at the bottom, and curve B, uh, the, um, the vertical 
vertical, the more vertical one, uh, more on the top of the graph. Um, the flat one uh, is when we manage to cut the chain of effects in time. So we reduce the impact in time. We, when we don't manage to cut the chain of uh, impact and consequences in time, then the impact of the crisis develops and becomes bigger. Uh, you could, of course, apply that to the pandemic, for instance. Uh, if we had known a number of things, if we had prepared a number of things, we could have probably flattened the curve in 2020, uh, uh, early 2020. Uh, right. So that's one part of uh, uh, the world we're in. The other part is, um, it's more positive. It's about an era of change of transformation which of course uh, is a challenge of course is difficult but is also very promising and uh, conceals many opportunities um, first of all transportation uh, globalization uh, uh, of the supply chains it has started more than 20 years ago already but it continues uh, and it's uh, it's not the end global trade uh, uh, is uh, pretty volatile. Um, trade, uh, the tra global trade uh, is also influenced by some drivers uh, which may accelerate uh, or uh, inhibit uh, the transformation. Sustainability the tra is a sustainable challenge. Fluctuation of car uh, con con currencies. Technologies, new technologies popping up here and there. Um, the uh, transportation infrastructure which carry on developing, economic development of certain countries uh, which become more able than before to supply us with advanced products and services. The consumers, the consumers have changed too, right? So this is a graph representing the 20th century. You see a first peak, a long one, uh, which is linked to the emergence of the middle class. Uh, and a second one uh, at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, uh, which is more linked to the richer people uh, being in a, uh, in a, in a buying position. Uh, manufacturing uh, is also shifting to new eras, right? So you can see here, uh, so the curve of uh, of the BRIC countries, the curve of China, um, the the curve of uh, Africa, uh, and we see that uh, manufacturing could go where the countries uh, have uh, a, a lot of manpower, <clears throat> a population a population aged uh, to manufacture. Uh, so manufacturing. Uh, can also be replaced or uh, altered uh, by robotization. Um, and R&D uh, is also shifting to new areas. Uh, you can see here uh, the, the curve of China, uh, which is growing a lot. So the generic mainframe of uh, where people, working people are, what um, working people do versus what robots do, and uh, where are the inventors and the innovators? <clears throat> All this is changing a lot uh, in the world of today's. Needless to say, uh, we live in a world which is teased by potential innovations coming on in the next decade, which will, will probably change not only a few industries, <coughs> but the way we will work. <laughs> Smart cities, smart homes, connected cars, autonomous driving, self-driving cars, uh, data-led services, precision agriculture, etc., etc. Um, another uh, trend, very important trend, uh, is uh, the power of ecosystems. Look at this, how simple it looks like. Uh, in reality, uh, this is an ecosystem made of many, many uh, so companies collaborating within the new uh, the, within a platform. So Rolls Royce here is just an orchestrator or a conductor of an orchestra, uh, uh, orchestrating uh, all these companies. More and more innovation, more and more pro 
whereas more and more initiatives are undertaken not by one person only, not by one company only, but by a certain weeness. And the weeness is an ecosystem of many companies putting money together, resources together, knowledge together uh, in, uh, uh, to develop a new concept. Uh, what's happening also is that we're stepping into territories for the next decade, uh, which are still very unknown to us. Personalization of everything, uh, when um, uh, each and every product will be personalized. Ecosystem, uh, innovating through ecosystem, we have just mentioned it. Sustainability, the pressure for more sustainability and a mandatory sustainable development uh, to be able to be a big player. Startups, concealing more and more business, more and more knowledge, more and more uh, ideas uh, which big companies need. Big data, uh, providing more and more integration uh, of, uh, of data uh, and contributing a lot to artificial intelligence, uh, being able through this integration of data to model your strategic decisions, to create an RFQ from scratch, to to uh, detect uh, weak signals at the supplier or in a market. Uh, Internet of Things will probably revolutionize uh, the existing supply chains. Blockchain, of course, uh, will change the, the, the way that we manage these chains. So procurement is changing. Uh, it becomes more complex. It is more team dependent. It is not anymore a question of a buyer or a CPO buying uh, on his or her side. It's a question of weeness, of collective leadership toward uh, the markets and toward uh, uh, the stakeholders. Um, procurement is changing also because it requires more and more soft skills. Uh, the key skills to have in procurement 40 years ago was to be able to analyze the market, to understand the cost, to model the cost, to, and, uh, and to understand needs. Procurement today is more a question of leadership, capability to take an initiative, a vision of business acumen, uh, of um, ability to disrupt, uh, to manage change, to resist uh, to, uh, to pressures. So procurement is changing because it needs more and more behavioral mental skills uh, that were not needed before. Uh, needless to say, procurement is changing too because the time frame has changed. Uh, the, there's always more pressure on time and it's uh, always more global um, uh, context. There's also a certain uncertainty of the context. So uh, in a nutshell, if we want to summarize that point, uh, what we can say is um, that Procurement in the old times was inside out. We were starting from procurement centric uh, and going out uh, to suppliers, to technologies, to innovators, to this, to that. Uh, procurement today needs to be outside in. We need to think long term. We need to think about the external capabilities which we don't have. We need to understand the change, the pace of the change, anticipate those changes and adapt uh, to, um, to, to, to what's happening. So the key competencies of the old procurement inside out was to focus, focus on price, focused on total cost, focus on risks, focus on markets. Um, the key skills uh, of the new procurement outside in is to be able to understand, to envision, to catch in time, to adapt, to be flexible, to be malleable. Right. Uh, uh, so um, we need to go out of a dead end. And the dead end is focusing only on price and costs. Uh, to go out of this dead end, we need to uh, focus on more positive value. Uh, how can we contribute to the market shares, uh, to the shares of our companies, to the profit, to the growth of our company, to the sales of our company? Uh, and this is not how procurement was born. Procurement was meant to manage the spend only. Uh, today, procurement has to manage much more than the spend. Procurement has to manage the spend, the risks, 
the future revenues, the future growth, uh, our future market share, uh, our total profi uh, profitability. Right. Uh, so this is about what we're in. Uh, uh, more crises uh, and an accelerating speed of change, a very a fast changing environment. Now, what should we do? Uh, how could we, should we manage crisis? Uh, so uh, let's go into uh, several uh, elements of answer. Um, how do human beings, and I would say even all kind of animals, if you think about animal reactions to risks and to danger, uh, how do we react uh, to, um, uh, to crisis and to risks? The first reaction is to run away, to flee from the danger. Um, so uh, this is, these are people who become less interested in procurement and run away of procurement just because procurement uh, is in a bad situation. So it may entail some uh, procurement professional leaving uh, the procurement function. It's also a disinterest, a disinvestment of yourself or of stakeholders uh, in buyers, in procurement. That's a first reaction. Another reaction is to freeze. Uh, instead of something I don't understand, I don't know how to, ma to handle, uh, I carry on doing as usual, I freeze my little ways of doing because this at least I know how to do. Uh, it is a syndrome of do your RFQ as usual. So in a, in a world that completely changes, Carry on, do the little thing that you are able to do that you're accustomed to do. It's about freezing. Instead of changing, it's about fossilizing it's, uh, oneself uh, into, um, a, a, into known uh, procedures and patterns. Another reaction is to go against, to go against uh, the, 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 the trend and uh, pointing fingers. Uh, at the supplier, at the stakeholder, at our predecessors, at our CPO, etc., et fight. The fourth reaction is to face up. To face up the challenge, to uh, not only to face up the challenge, but to take it up, uh, to take the gauntlet, uh, to take up the gauntlet, uh, we need to learn, to learn from the change. And we need to make ourselves in a learning disposition, of course. Uh, and this is what can make procurement agile, becoming a learning organization. The concept of learning organization dates back to the 80s, even the 70s. And um, so it's 50 years old. Uh, some companies have adopted it more than others. Some functions have adopted it more than others. But um, that, uh, that is uh, not necessarily in procurement. Procurement is probably uh, a function which is late in learning, uh, increasing one's own perceptions, learning to uh, capitalize information, to change one's own reactions, uh, learning to react differently, becoming a learning organization. So what to do? Uh, there are three modes or three model, uh, three, th three dimensions uh, when responding to a crisis. The in dimension, the in response, the through response, and the beyond response. The in is going into the problem, the through response is being able to survive the problem and resolve the problem. And the beyond response is very important because it builds credibility and it prepares for the future crisis. So it's taking advantage of the problem to have learned something new that makes us stronger and that makes us uh, more prone to react to future risks. Uh, so uh, how to um, manage the, the uh, in response? Uh, the in response uh, is... Um, uh, has to do uh, with uh, managing the magnitude, uh, uh, framing the crisis by understanding uh, how many people are affected, 
the uh, interdependency, how problems are intricated into one another, how stakeholders or variables are interconnected into one another, the urgency of the problem, the uncertainty, if we know that crisis, if we know what it's about, or we are absolutely without any knowledge, any previous experience of it, and the severity of the impact. So first of all, we need to frame the crisis and to understand these parameters. How, what's its magnitude? How interdependent are problems from one another? What's the level of urgency? How uncertain uh, is, uh, is that crisis? How severe are the impacts? And uh, is it a recurring crisis? From uh, uh, these parameters, we will classify the crisis uh, in, into a scale. A simple crisis is a crisis of no known, of known knowns, right? We know the problem, we know how to solve it. IT system crash, for instance, a fire, for instance. To a complicated crisis, uh, these are known unknowns, right? It's something unknown, like a pandemic, um, but uh, we know how to solve it. We need to develop a vaccine. Huh? Um, to unknown unknown, right? We know the problem, but we don't, we don't have any clue about how to solve it. We don't know what to invest in. We don't know what to do, where to go, right? Global warming, cyber attack, to chaotic crisis in which we don't even know the problem that is happening to us. Uh, we don't even know what this is. Huh? Remember 9-11 uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so we, once we have classified these crises at different levels, we can um, uh, we can uh, develop a response and a type of leadership to respond to these crises. If it's a simple crisis, uh, it should be fact-based answer, right? Um, if it's a complicated crisis, we need to co-determine and create an idea, which means that uh, we need to create to to to, uh, to create a shared leadership, speak with others, create a certain weeness, and um, build a plan together. If it's a complex crisis, we need to involve higher people. We need to involve the CEO. We need to involve um, governmental regulators. If it's a chaotic crisis, we need to uh, discover the patterns, to experiment patterns, see what works, learn from what works, and then start to build uh, progressively uh, the, the type of reaction uh, to have. That is for the in crisis. Now there's a through crisis. How to survive? Uh, we are surviving. We're going to uh, be alive after the crisis. If during the crisis uh, we keep having an attitude and a vision, a vision is the ability to tell people where we are going, what is the final vision, what will be the reality like when the crisis is over, and saying this during the crisis. So we reassure people with uh, and the assurance of the final picture of what it will look like after the crisis. That helps to recover. That, that, that builds what we call a recovery intelligence. The attitude... Uh, is uh, more about the human dispositions with which we answer to people having problems during the, the crisis. Uh, so how do we react? How do we, um, uh, uh, how do we treat problems? How do we treat people? What are values? Uh, how do we include stakeholders? So this is the through response. If we have a vision, a final vision, um, if we are able to tell the new normal after the crisis, while the crisis, uh, the crisis is still ongoing, then we inspire a vision uh, and make people trust our vision. If through the crisis people know that we don't know where we go, but we know that we can speak to procurement because procurement will help, because procurement will help a vision, because procurement will understand my problems, because procurement knows how to listen to me, etc. If they trust our ability, our human ability, our human attitudes, uh, then of course uh, we create our survival, a trust that will make us survive 
after the crisis. Um, now, the last dimension of, uh, um, uh, of crisis management is that th through within crisis and through crisis, we learn. We learn um, and, uh, and we capitalize information, knowledge, know-how, know how to be that builds our competencies, that builds uh, our, um, uh, our abilities. So when uh, we are in the middle of a crisis, we, we have to keep in mind that we are creating an identity through the reaction we have uh, during the crisis. We leave a legacy after the the crisis. We will make a difference. If we make no difference, if the crisis would have been the same with the same results with us or without us, probably we're not creating a, any identity. We're not uh, going beyond the crisis. Um, if, we're, if the strategic intent uh, is not clear, uh, uh, how to go there, what are our strategies? If the purpose uh, of um, uh, uh, of our existence, the existence of a procurement department, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is not clear. We will probably not survive crisis. So while battling, uh, uh, fighting against the fire of the crisis, we need to have clear uh, to, to have clear ideas and to reassert our intended legacy, our core values, the purpose of procurement the strategies that procurement uh, want, uh, to, uh, wants to implement. Right, uh, so that was about managing the crisis. Now, of course, another problem is the pace of the change uh, because it has accelerated like crazy uh, in the last decade. Um, there's a model saying that uh, what summarizes uh, the the base of uh, of our context is the VUCA acronym, right? VUCA standing for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. What does this mean? Ambiguity means that causal relations are unclear. We don't know if A is because of B or B because of A, or maybe A, B, A and B are, de are deriving from C. We don't understand the correlation. Complexity is that everything is interconnected with everything. It has to do with interconnectedness. Uncertainty means that um, we don't know what will happen and what can create effects. Volatility means that uh, causal relations are of short life uh, and um, immediate reaction is needed because long-term reaction uh, will, uh, will, will, uh, will not be uh, effective. So what to do uh, and from in an ambiguous environments we need to run tests learn share lessons uh, deduce from the experiments we're doing we're having uh, deduce some causal links some interpretation making strategic experiments formalizing procurement business cases and notably failure the business cases of failure supply failure price increase etc etc in front of complexity uh, we need to uh, cut this complexity in small chunks to make it more manageable, which means that in procurement, we fr frequently have to debundle, debundle big volumes which we have put together, which, we, which, we, which have created uh, an extremely complex uh, supply context. Uh, Deprocess, because sometimes following the existing processes uh, the procurement process, uh, we create complexity instead of reducing it. To manage uncertainty, we need to get more information, to access more to information, uh, to watch markets, to scrutinize suppliers, to capitalize information. Volatility, uh, to fight against volatility, we should shorten our reaction time. Uh, so that we are more prone to react in a very little time. So we should work on reinforcing our quickness uh, and, um, and our learning pr procedures. Um, when you apply VUCA, the VUCA model uh, to procurement, it frequently becomes a VICAS, right? It's very close to VUCA, but 
uh, it's about variety, interdependency, interconnectedness, complexity, change, tomorrow will have nothing to do with today, ambiguity and seamlessness. It's like, uh, it looks like everything is into one. Uh, so seamlessness is when at the very end, beyond something which looks very simple, there's a lot of complexity which is hidden uh, in the simplicity of the output. Think about the submarine uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we have um, discussed previously. Um, so uh, le let me jump uh, over that. Uh, to uh, be able uh, to uh, envision uh, uh, leadership, we need to define the North Pole of procurement. What, are, what, what is the star which orientates uh, our action? So uh, uh, in front of variety, ambiguity, complexity, interdependency, seamlessness and change, we need to position to take some roles. Uh, one role is to become an architect by reorganizing teams. Uh, another role is to tell stories, supply story, business cases, good stories, bad stories, stories of failure in which we learn a lot. Another role is to uh, learn from supply stories and supplier histories. That means to capitalize, not only to have formalized the story, but uh, to take out of them uh, some principles, uh, a method, uh, some conclusions, some, pr some principles. Uh, so learn from supply stories and supply histories. Um, to manage interdependency, interdependency, we need to coordinate more, notably to coordinate more with stakeholders uh, and with suppliers and with both of them, putting them, both of them, uh, in a stronger collaboration. To manage more uh, seamlessness, we need to redelineate redeline re categories of purchase frequently, Categories of purchase are still types of products or services, right? So it's a product categorization. Today it has no meaning uh, because many suppliers are able to provide you with a compound of products and services. Uh, and sometimes the same product or service uh, can be provided in by one local supplier in one country or by global supplier in other countries. Um, so we need to create categories which have to do with the markets and not with the products. To manage change, we have to be like profits. We have to explain our market vision, our supply vision, our technology vision uh, to tell the company um, what we're heading to. Uh, uh, when... Uh, um, People uh, address, uh, oppose the speed of change. Uh, we need then uh, to understand uh, the magnitude, the number of people opposing, the intensity, the energy, the, 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 the invest in opposing us, the scope uh, opposed, uh, and the depth and the intention uh, to address uh, the right issue. Right. Uh, now let's go for three small parts, which are already some small conclusions, I would say, about crisis management. In the last decade, uh, some concepts have emerged or strengthened. I mean, dexterity is not from the last decade. It's almost a 30-year-old concept, but it has um, uh, emerged and uh, as fruitful for the business and notably for procurement in the last decade. So we will speak about ambidexterity, about uh, resilience, and about paradox management. So uh, ambidexterity, what is it about? The definition of ambidexterity is that uh, we exploit at the same time that we explore. Exploiting means being efficient in uh, doing more of the same, right? repeating our routines, our patterns of working, and being very efficient in it. Today's business. Exploring is about innovating new ways, get, deviating from routines and patterns, uh, innovating new paths, 
uh, adopting these new paths, experimenting, learning uh, out of these new paths, uh, and um, build something for the future. Uh, the logic of ambidexterity is that in a world of changes, of accelerated change, the companies who survive are ambidextrous, or the other way around, companies who are not ambidextrous have little chances to survive in today's business. Um, and procurement makes no exception. Procurement needs to be ambidextrous, but procurement has structured itself in a very exploitative mode for the last 60 years, uh, processing what uh, we are doing, uh, following routines, crystallizing, fossilizing routines, and not, not enabling people, not allowing people sometimes to deviate uh, from these routines. So uh, in procurement, what does it mean? We need to exploit and we need to carry on reducing costs, achieving savings, satisfying needs. But we also need to develop something new. Uh, transform radically the, the way that we work with suppliers, how we respond to stakeholders, uh, how we manage purchasing organizations, the type of initiatives that we take, the, uh, the, um, the, the leadership that we have in the organization, uh, uh, spanning boundaries, not speaking only about what we buy, but through the suppliers and the technology that we have detected going uh, uh, to speak to marketing and sales, spanning those boundaries to take care about what we not only buy, but what we sell or what we will sell. All right. Uh, so uh, strategic and bit dexterity uh, is uh, crucial when uh, companies operate in strategic environments, in turbulent environments, in fast moving environments, in transformational environments. And I have some news for you. Uh, most of the environments in which procurement departments operate are strategic, turbulent, fast-moving, and transformational. So there's no we have no choice. We need to be ambidextrous. Um, uh, right. Um, so uh, next um, uh, point I'd like to say is about resilience. We need to be ambidextrous, but we also need to be to develop resilience to become uh more resilient um the nothing fails more uh than successful routines so be careful of routines when they are successful because the reflex of human beings and successful is to freeze it and carry on doing the same and 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 because we're repeating we're fossilizing our patterns uh then very unfortunately, at a certain moment, we fail. Uh, we fail to catch the right technology. We fail to write and associate with the right supplier. Uh, we fail to penetrate the right market, to launch the right product, etc., etc. because we've been fossilizing too much, focusing too much on what we already knew. So um, this is what we call strategic drift. Now, you can see here a small curve, a blue curve, which is a curve of change, uh, the change of the environment, and a red curve, which is a, a company or a department trying to cope with the speed of the change, which is increasing. Uh, and you see that in the very first uh, the moments, the, the change is iterative, right? So little by little, we carry on. Uh, following the change. But little by little, in reality, the distance with the, the change becomes bigger. And at a certain moment between phase two and phase three, the gap between what the world demands from us, the suppliers want, how the suppliers want to work, the technologies uh, um, uh, available, and what we do, the technologies we use, the suppliers we use, the type of uh, uh, the ways of working with the supplier is so big, that we enter into a flux mode. Into the flux mode, we um, have erratic uh, adaptations uh, to what's happening. The more we are in a flux mode, uh, erratic uh, change after erratic change, the more we come to a key point, which is either we transform completely 
and reach again, rally the transformation of technology of suppliers of the world, or we don't do that, and it's called strategic decay, and it's usually uh, leading uh, to, uh, to death. So uh, be careful of uh, supply market concentration, of unsuccessful innovation, of product launches, of gap with the norm, because the more you lose control of the supply market structure, of the innovations, of the technologies, of the product launches, uh, of the norms, the more you're entering the flux, uh, in which small changes have a bigger magnitude, uh, and that small changes in the environment become negative adaptations and not only um, uh, positive ones. Um, so, uh, how to become resilient then? Um, we need to analyze the risks. We need to reorganize procurement. Uh, for some companies, it means globalizing. For other companies, it means relocalizing. For other companies, it's splitting procurement in different business units. Uh, for other companies, it means co-procurement, meaning bundling our procurement task force with another company procurement task force. Um, or it can be buying together with another company. Uh, we need uh, to pay attention to unsuccessful tenders. Uh, because when we launch an RFQ and there's no answer or one answer, uh, one simple answer to make is that, yeah, maybe there's only one supplier or maybe the suppliers are not answering to our, uh, our tenders because they're not interested in them uh, anymore. Um, we need to compare the supplier market with the customer market. So we need to raise our awareness of what to do and how to react uh, to to the changes uh, of the uh, of the markets. Um, okay. Uh, last point uh, is about polarity management. Polarity management. Uh, so, what is it about? Um, the question is paradoxes. Uh, paradoxes means that one thing can be true and its contrary can be true too. Uh, and it's frequently the effect of novelties of innovation, the breakthrough of novelties, uh, the contradiction of routines, the challenge, uh, and the tension between uh, different opposites. Uh, so frequently paradoxes have to do with transformation. We have an old word uh, with conclusions with beliefs, with creeds. We have a new world with a new creed, a new breed of people. And, uh, and the contradiction between these two worlds forces us to reshape our perceptions, to modify our understanding uh, of the world. Uh, so uh, one of the first paradoxes is, uh, should we solve the problem or accommodate to a problem? Huh? Solve means fixing, eliminating, discarding, back to the old normal. Uh, accommodate to a problem means changing goals, changing roles, reorganizing, change behaviors, proactively constructing a new normal. Uh, and you understand that in polarity management, we decide not to choose. Uh, we choose not to choose. We will be solving and accommodating and not solving or accommodating. So polarity management is doing both at the same time, solving and accommodating. Going from a linear thinking to a reflexive thinking and doing both. Um, it is about choosing not to choose because there is truth and wisdom on more than one side uh, of a problem. So how do we manage that? Um, we uh, have two options huh? uh, uh, or two opinions, A or B. Instead of choosing between A and B, we just go to the benefits of A, the benefits of B, the drawbacks of A, the drawbacks of B, uh, and try to mm, maximize both benefits and take care about both uh, drawbacks. So we learn to self-contradict people all the time, notably in the team. 
So what are the actions we, that we can undertake uh, when B when B is gaining audience uh, to say, hey, A is also very interesting, and there is opportunity in the A scenario, okay? Um, uh, and as for drawbacks, uh, we put early warning signals to rebalance uh, the, the the mode. Right. So. Um, uh, what can be these paradoxes? Uh, it's about avoiding risks or taking risks. It's about uh, having the supply management, the selection of a supplier, the steering of a supplier led by a buyer and a stakeholder and not or a stakeholder. It's about splitting or grouping categories. It's about maintaining a certain distance with is, uh, the vendor. Uh, a transactional distance, a contract, not very frequent meetings, uh, or uh, enforcing an intimacy with the buyer, with the vendor. Uh, joint teams, uh, frequent steering committees, work together every week with the supplier. Uh, and sometimes we can combine both. It's about uh, measuring price and measuring TCO. It is about uh, being cooperative and competitive. So we need to think twice about uh, these oppositions because uh, the natural way of uh, thinking is about choosing between the opposites, whereas uh, polarity management is about choosing not to choose, uh, to do both and to take advantage of both. Right, this is the end of this webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I've been happy to, uh, uh, to, to, to leverage these themes uh, together with you today. Uh, we still have five minutes, so you still have a little time uh, to ask questions, make comments. I can see that people are starting to express themselves on the chat. So if you need to ask any question, if you have any comment that you would like to say, please write that on the chat. It will appear, and I'll try to, uh, to answer this. Thank you for your comments, uh, which I can read. Palomares, uh, Luis, Alexandra. Any question? Nicola, Tolga, Julio, Jose Angel, Antonio. <laughs> uh, there's a comment I'd like to comment myself. Uh, Tolga is saying, uh, I think all those are for the whole life. Yeah, probably, you're right, you're right. Uh, it may be a little philosophy about how to lead life. Um, but I'd like to take your comment the other way around. Maybe it's our management which was not close enough to life. Uh, we have managed procurement and we have managed suppliers we have managed supplies for 50 years in a very mechanistic way as if there were already many many suppliers available as if the supplier were always willing to supply us and competing to supply us as if the prices could be stable as etc etc and the problem is is as if so now we're living in a more turbulent world but maybe you know as you're saying Tolga it may be just the nature of life, the nature of the world. We just need to make our management more mature uh, and to adapt the way that we manage. Isn't that an optimization question? Uh, very good point. Um, I'm not sure it's opti I don't know what you mean by optimization. I would say that uh, it's a question of of making management uh, closer to real life. Uh, I was saying just before that we lived for 50 years or 60 years in an illusion of a mechanistic world, right? But the world is not mechanic. Uh, suppliers have preferences. Suppliers prefer to work with an industry than with another. Um, 
uh, ideas emerge when people work well together. So innovation comes from good relations too, right? Uh, good ideas, good rationales come from nice emotional situations. Uh, so uh, maybe we can call that optimization, uh, but it's, um, it's a question of uh, development of management. We, ha we, we can say it as such, we have managed procurement until, until our decade, until the last decade, in a mechanistic way, which means in a very poor way, in a very simplistic way, simplified way. Now that the world is complex, or complex that it has always been and it has to be, then we just need to make our management more complex. So we need to adapt to life. Uh, uh, to real life, which is complex, which is volatile, which is uncertain, which is ambiguous. Okay, any other question, comment, before we close this webinar? Then, thank you very much for uh, all your, uh, uh, for, 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 for being patient enough to, to listen to this long webinar, uh, for all your questions. And I wish I had the pleasure to meet you again uh, in a following webinar. There's lots of webinars program at the IPM, uh, some of them this summer, a lot of them in autumn. Hope to see you soon uh, on this channel. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.